Would you please take your Bibles this morning and stand with me as we turn to this morning's reading. We'll be reading from the epistle of 1 John chapter 4. That's on page 1023 if you're using one of the pew Bibles. I'll be reading from verse 16 for this morning's reading. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. Please follow along with me as I read. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. May the Lord add His blessing this morning to the reading of His Word. You may be seated. So I want to give a few prefaces to this morning's message this morning before we get started or move too far along. <clears throat> the theme of this Christmas series is Sinai to Bethlehem. Sinai is where the ten words or commands were given to God's people Israel, and Bethlehem is where His Son Jesus was born. And so with each sermon through December, I hope to draw a connection from Sinai, from the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, to Bethlehem, the coming of Jesus Christ. It's the first preface I want to give. The second <clears throat> is this passage in 1 John 4. I've often said that if the most popular verse in the world from God's Word is what would, you, what would you say? What do you see held up and written on walls? And John 3.16, if that's the most popular verse in the Bible, in all the world, the second most popular verse in all the world should be 1 John 4.16, which is this. John 3.16 talks about God loving the world. 1 John 4.16 says, since we believe that God loves us, then we and then it talks about how we live on this earth, having absorbed God's love for us. So John 3.16 should always be connected to 1 John 4.16. That's the second preface. And then the third preface for this morning's message is this is going to be a bit of a unique message. <clears throat> in that, the last verse that we'll get to in this morning's message, the last verse that will appear on the screen is this passage, 1 John 4.16a. In other words, this entire message is an introduction. So you just need to kind of feel that. Everything is building up to 1 John 4.16a. So that was the third preface, and now I want to look at the outline for this morning's message. Let's take a look at the screen. <clears throat> Our three primary points are these. The ten's focal point, which is our heart. The ten's focal point, which is our heart. Second, internalizing the ten and our failure. And then, internalized in Christ, our ticket. Let me say that one more time. The ten's focal point, is our heart. So we attempt to internalize them. We fail. And yet when we are internalized in Christ, we have our ticket. Alright, let's begin with the tens focal point. Our heart. We've sought to understand and interpret the Ten Commandments on their terms. It's very important. If, if, if traveling five years now through Genesis and Exodus has taught us one thing, it should have taught us that God does not expect the people who read, read His book to be lazy. 
we are to be very intent in scrutinizing what he intended his word to say and not be cheap readers of his books. 66 of them. We are to read them very closely. Eyes on the text. Not necessarily, it's, it's helpful to read large swaths of Scripture and it's helpful to look minutely at the smallest shreds of Scripture. To understand them both wide and minutely. But as we look at the ten words of the ten commands, what we find in them is a strategy to help you interpret them rightly. And here's the strategy that we've went off of. And if it hasn't become clear yet, I hope this morning to make it very, very startlingly clear. And that is this. The ten words are bookended by commands of the, everybody say it, heart. The ten words are bookended, let's go to the screen, sorry. The ten words are bookended by commands of the heart. What do I mean by that? Well, the first commandment is to have no other gods. Do you know right now if the person sitting next to you has another god? You don't. People go to church all the time and don't have God as their God. The people Jesus said woe to the most were the churchgoers. So you don't know that. You don't know if my God is the true God ultimately. That is something that is of each person's heart. You can't know that for sure. You can't see it. You can't experience it by your senses. All five of them. And then the last commandment, the tenth, is no coveting. Can you tell if the person sitting next to you right now is coveting? My beard, my physique, you don't know. You can't know if somebody's coveting. So, the Ten Commandments are delivered to us in such a way that they are bookended by commands that you can't see in another person. That's what I'm talking about about reading His Word slowly and carefully and trying to figure it out. There's a bit of a science to it. Good art has layers, does it not? You ever listen to a song and you're like, now I get what he was talking or she was talking about when she wrote that line. Andrew Peterson has a line that, and Becky's always good at saying, I think this is what they meant. I'm like, oh, duh! Andrew Peterson, one of our favorite musicians, has a line where he's talking about his car being like a coffin. So he's driving in the night. It's dark in his car. He's going through a spiritual crisis. And then he talks about that she called him. And the she that he was referring to is his wife. And he says the car flooded with sacred light. What is that? What's he mean? Well, it means that his cell phone lit up and flooded the car with sacred light from his wife calling. It's such a poetic way to say it, but as you think about it, and she was calling him back home, and I don't know what was going on, but it's it's this line that you listen to a thousand times, and all of a sudden, maybe when you're driving at night, and your phone clicks on, and you see the light come in the car and glow, you're like, oh, that's what he was talking about. That's the way the Bible is written. It's, It's narrative, poetic. Art. It's art. It's meant to be studied, observed. One of my favorite books is written by a guy named Henry Nouwen on the return of the prodigal. And it's a 20 by 20 foot portrait or painted by Rembrandt. They have it in St. Petersburg in Russia. And Henry Nouwen arranged with the museum to be able to look at this with no other visitors for three days straight and just sat there and observed this painting and then wrote a book on what he found. It's one of my favorite books. Highly recommended by Henry Nouwen. But as he observed it, he noticed things that he wouldn't have noticed if he just passed on to the next thing. And that's the way the Bible is meant to be written. uh, Meant to be understood and interpreted, I should say. 
So when you understand the ten words, you notice that the first and the last you can't see in other people. And this is in counterdistinction to the other commandments. Notice on the screen as we just jump through them very quickly. The second commandment. Can you see someone carving images? You can see that. Can you hear someone taking God's name in vain? Can you observe that? You can through the senses. Can you watch someone not observe Sabbath? You can see that. Hey, you weren't there back then. You understand it. You can hear and see someone not honoring their parents. You can watch and observe a person murdering. You can see the committing of adultery with your eyes. You can observe a person stealing, and you can hear a person lie. But you can't see when someone covets, and you can't see who's everyone, who is everyone's true God. So, what this escorts us to is understanding that these commands are not meant to be firstly pursued in an external sense. If they're bookended by the heart, then they are to be all grappled with where? On the outside with your hands and feet and eyes and mouth and ears? No. It's supposed to start in the unseeable things. It's supposed to start in your heart. So don't read, you shall not murder and say, I've done that. Don't do that. Start asking yourself, have I ever wanted to murder someone? This is to take the commands on their terms. Don't say, have I ever actually physically been intimate with someone who is not my spouse? Don't ask that question. Ask yourself, has I, have I ever considered thoughts? Have I ever gone there? Have I ever compared? Have I ever done this sort of thing? Start inside. Don't start out here. Don't ask, did I, did I ever like bold-faced lie to someone? Oh, that should be an easy answer. But ask, have I ever led someone astray? Have I ever lied to myself about myself? Start in the things that no one can see. That's what the brackets, the bookends, tell you. That our, It's like all the Ten Commandments are standing up on the stage here and they say, we care first and foremost about your heart. Not, not your external observance. Let's all start on the unseen things. That's where it all starts anyway, right? I want to put a comparative list of how you can interpret the Ten Commandments wrongly and how you can interpret them rightly. There's nothing special about this list, but I, I hope it will assist us in, in saying, have I looked at these wrong? Have I looked at these right? Let's take a look. The first, comparison. It's wrong to consider the Ten Commandments firstly thinking about external performance. What they want you first to think about, what they want to lead you to, is internal alignment. Now, of course, that will show up in external inconformity or conformity, but it wants you to think firstly about the inside of you. That's why it brackets it that way. Second, it, it, it causes you to stop asking the question, how do I stop doing these things? How do I just screw the screw down a little tighter and, 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 and work on my self-effort and my willpower? You've lived through a, enough New Year's resolutions to know that that doesn't work, right? So it causes you to stop asking that question and start asking, why am I this type of person? Not why do I do these things, why do I want to do these things? Third, stops with the self-effort and the willpower, and it begins to say, okay, what is wrong with me is not within reach. What is wrong with me is beyond my reach. Listen, have you ever had an appointment with a surgeon? 
when you sit down with the surgeon, you as much as go to his or her office with the acknowledgement that you can't do what they can do. You can't reach where they can reach. You don't have that ability. That's why you're there. You sit down with them because you have a problem you can't fix, and they can. That's the point of going to a surgeon. You have an internal problem that they alone can get to. They got the instruments and the setup to get there, and you can't. That's what the Ten Commandments lead you to, or should lead you to. I have a problem that's beyond my scope. It's out of my wheelhouse. I cannot fix this. Fourth. Let's go one more. External conformity to internal renewal. The, the very first is about performance. But now, like you, 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 with that performance, you're trying to conform wholly. But what you understand is that something inside of you needs to change. Otherwise, you'll just keep going in the same direction. Next. Wrong interpretation is thinking through these laws and trying to make them manageable somehow. Of, of detailing them and working them through and dicing them up to make them manageable. And what you're more concerned about is how do I become malleable to this commandment? How do I, how do I conform or reform or be changed to this because I can't attain to it? I can't make it manageable the only way it will become manageable is if I am reshaped. Next. You'll stop thinking of breaking them on ten occasions and just look at them as okay. You shall not bear false witness in court. And you know, I, I, thankfully I've never had to go to court and I won't have to even maybe confront this in my lifetime. Instead, you'll chase that command down to am I a dishonest person in any way, shape, or form with myself? with God, with other people. You'll see it is not breaking on ten occasions, but a breaking on ten thousand occasions if you're interpreting them rightly. Next. You'll stop thinking them in terms of letter of the law and in the spirit of the law. You, you know, imagine I say to my boys, we're out working in the yard and we borrow a shovel from Loretta and I say, hey guys, listen. When you borrow a tool from your neighbor, you need to return it to them. It's important. And then you go on later in life, and Sim or Finn, Bo, Judah, one of those guys has grown up, and they've borrowed their neighbor's shovel, and they're, that, that thought, that word that I said to them came to mind, and they're bringing that shovel back to their neighbor, but it's coated in mud. Now, should they say to themselves, Dad said to return the tool. He didn't say clean it off. What was the law underneath that law? The law underneath the law of return your neighbor's tool is treat your neighbor respectfully. Treat your neighbor well. And, and that was the intent of the law. I said it on a specific thing, but I meant something very deep. To even the point where the boy was, would clean off the shovel, and maybe not just even clean off the shovel, but... As he returns the shovel, say to the neighbor, hey, I've got this, this, and this in my garage. If you ever need that, I'm more than happy to loan it to you. Just say the word. In other words, from that one command, that one word, they should take it a million different directions and, and embody the spirit of the, the law, not just the letter. And then finally, you're not to compartmentalize the law, but you're to integrate it as a whole, what you're meant to do with the law is say, okay, what do every one of these laws have to do with each other? In other words, these aren't just a scattering of ten independent things. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chew on them to such a degree that I could say this is what this one has in common, and this is what this one has in common, and this is what they all have in common. This is the idea. This is to interpret the ten words rightly. Now, you could say, okay, okay. I appreciate you dicing the Ten Commandments and trying to understand them well. But how do you 
know that's how you're supposed to interpret the ten? How do you know that this list is spot on right? Well, what we'll find after Christmas as we continue through Exodus and go into the next three chapters, which are just filled with different laws of different types, what we'll demonstrate as we go through those three chapters of laws on this and that and this and the other thing and all these different laws, you'll find that every one of those laws has a tracing back point to the Ten Commandments. In other words, what comes after the ten words are are the application of the ten words, as it were. So we'll see that. But what you'll also see as you continue reading through the Bible is you'll encounter the prophets. And the prophets' biggest yearning, what they want more than anything, is for the law of the Old Testament to go from outside a person to inside a person. Look at Ezekiel 36, 25-27. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put My Spirit within you and cause you to walk in My statutes and be careful to obey My rules. And listen, I believe it's with great intent that Ezekiel, quoting from the Lord, is very intent on saying a heart of stone which very much aligns with what were the Ten Commandments written on? Stone. And to say, I'm going to take these things that I wrote on stone and I'm going to actually put them in your heart. And you say, okay, well how do you know that's what Ezekiel meant? Look at how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. He's writing the Corinthians and he's saying you're embodying the law. And look at how he writes it. You show that you are a letter from Christ delivered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. This is the idea that to interpret the Ten Commandments properly according to the prophets, according to the New Testament writers, is to say you need to read the Ten Commandments not with your behavior in mind, but with your heart in mind. That's the starting point. We'll get to your behavior. But you've got to start with the type person you are. Not in your incriminating offenses. It's where it starts. It's where it begins with you. It's where it begins with your children. Your grandchildren. It begins where it begins with your coworker, Not with his or her external behavior. But with their heart. It's where it all starts. Guard your heart, Solomon says. For from it flow the springs of life. Proverbs 4.23 And beyond the prophets and Paul, it's exactly what we see Christ do. Listen to what Christ says in Mark 7.21-23 and I've added some things so you can see. Jesus says, From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, um, applicable to the seventh of adultery, Theft, applicable to the eighth. Murder, to the sixth. Adultery, to the seventh. Coveting, to the tenth. Wickedness, deceit, to the ninth. Sensuality, envy, to the tenth. Slander, to the ninth. Pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from, you say it. So what you find is that Jesus goes from one instance to a variety. He takes all these commands and He says, yeah, that's out here, but all of out here comes from within. We read Psalm 1 and it says, Blessed is the man who meditates on the law day and night. We are to meditate on the Ten Commandments day and night according to to the psalmist, and you might ask the question, this is a serious question, I'm not being facetious, okay? 
If Psalm 1 tells you to meditate on the law day and night, just think about that. Let's say that together. Meditate on the law day and night. Why would you ever read Psalm 2? He's talking about the law. He's talking about the first five books of the Bible. Why would you ever read Psalm 2? How could you read Psalm 2 without sinning? What time left is there? Is there ever a time that it's not day or night? Does he want dusk? Is that what he's saying? How could you not sin and read Psalm 2? Well, the reason you can't sin when you read, or you're not sinning when you read Psalm 2, the only way that's possible is if Psalm 2 was itself a meditation on the law. It's the only way you couldn't sin and read Psalm 2. Is Psalm 2 a meditation on the law? Well, what you find is that the book of Psalms itself is broken up into five books. How many books are there of the law? Five books. The longest psalm in the psalm is itself the longest meditation in all the Scriptures on the law. Psalm 119. So, the book of Psalms is telling you meditate on the law and watch with me, read with me as I do for the next five books. I'm meditating on the law. Meditate with me. How could you read the New Testament and not be sinning? Well, what does Jesus say? I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. So Jesus is fulfilling the law. So we are to look at this book. It's uniquely special. For us to consider it is to consider the riches of Christ. And as you consider the Ten Commandments, you get to know the character of God. And God is such that He cares first and foremost about your inner person. God is not a slap the hand father. He's a sit down and let's talk this out. Not saying there's never a time for physical discipline. I am saying what you should be most concerned about in our kids is their hearts. It's the first thing. One of the bad things about living in such a busy life is we can move on from thing to thing to thing and never consider our hearts. Never consider why we do what we do. Never consider why our kids do what they do. It's much easier to watch TV than it is to talk with your spouse about why your kid does what he or she does. Jeremiah 9, 23-24, this is our God. He says this, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows Me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Friends, we are to be concerned about our insides knowing God. We're to be concerned not about the outshoot of the fountain, but the inside of the fountain that you can't see. Proverbs says, the heart of a man is like deep waters, but a wise man will draw it out. And we need to be coming to God to draw out what is inside of us. Why am I, why do I respond this way? Why do I manipulate this way? Why am I so concerned about this, that, and the other thing? Why am I more inclined to act than I am to pray? Why do I care so much about what these folks think of me instead of what He thinks of what's inside of me? We are to be people of depth because God encourages us there. It's fascinating. Scribe comes up to Jesus in Matthew 22 and he says, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? 
Remember how I said the right way to interpret the Ten Commandments is not isolating and compartmentalizing, but integrating them and seeing them as a whole? It's exactly what Jesus does. I get that from Him. Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. First four commandments. This is the, the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And in Mark's context, Mark records what that scribe or another scribe that asked that question said to him. And listen to, listen to this scribe's response to Jesus answering him that way. I want you to see how this scribe responded and how Jesus receives his response favorably. Check this out. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that He had answered wisely, He said to him, You are not far from the Kingdom of God. In other words, you took the Ten Commandments in their right direction. That's fascinating. You're not far from the Kingdom, Jesus says. He commends him. Why? Because this individual, having chewed and meditated on God's law, saw them wholly, saw them as an internal thing that was precious to God. And Jesus is very happy. So, His articulation of the law was right. Now, what I want to do is I want to say, let's close this first point out by saying what matters to God first and foremost is our what? Heart. Let's say it again. What matters to God first and foremost is our heart. It's not what we do. It's why we do it. It's not what we do. It's why we do it. Start there. That's where you start. With yourself and with everyone around you. So, when it comes to internalizing them, because that's what God wants. He wants to see purity on the inside. When it comes to internalizing them, what do we find? Well, we find that we are a failure. I'm going to read to you two passages that just gut me from the inside if I read them honestly. And I believe they'll do the same to you. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-7 Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is where the Ten Commandments all go. They go to love. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 22. They find their realization in love. They're a bunch of do-nots. Love takes care of all the do-nots. Love does it all. Paul says if you love your neighbor as yourself, you've fulfilled the law. Love does it all. Are you a person of love? Second passage. Galatians 5, 22-23. Pastor Alex did an amazing job several months ago speaking, or maybe a year ago now, speaking on this passage uh, downstairs, and he touched on it upstairs as well, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, and that all of these other fruits of the Spirit are derivatives of love. They come out of love. Joy. Peace. Are you a person of these things? Patience. Kindness. Goodness. 
faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. You fulfill these things, no law will condemn you. Because the law leads to all these things. So, when it comes to internalizing the Ten Commandments, we are failures. And this is why Jesus was born. It's one of the primary reasons why Jesus was born. To point out that you're a failure at this. That I'm a failure at this. Consider Luke 2, 34-35. What Simeon says to Mary, Jesus' mother. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So the law is meant to go into your internals. That's where it's meant to work. That's where it's meant to flow out of But Jesus came to this earth to point to that internal object inside of us and say, you don't line up. You don't fulfill the love to which these laws pointed. Not on your insides. You might think you passed the test of adultery, but have you ever lusted? You might think you passed the test of murder, but have you ever hated? Jesus takes these laws and He pierces hearts with them. That's what He does on this earth. He exposes the insides which we can't get to. Like a surgeon sitting with you across from his or her desk shows you an x-ray and says, do you see that? This is what's wrong. This is what needs to be amended, fixed, ripped out. We have dear friends, Dave and Cindy Fox, and they have a son, Adam, who's married to his dear wife, Elisa. And we've been praying on Wednesday nights for their little boy, Wilson. And he had a tumor in his hip. He was walking funny. And one thing led to another where they discovered a cancerous tumor. And when they first told everyone that, it was, that, they had, that uh, Wilson had cancer, they mentioned that on the doctors going and looking at the tumor, he discovered necrotic flesh around it. And I didn't understand that term. And Becky's like, oh, that's so bad. That's so bad. That's so bad. I was like, what's the thing? She's like, the flesh around it is like rotting. It's cancerous. By God's grace, Wilson just had surgery and they removed it. And so far, so good. We pray for that little guy. But this is the deal. We have a tumor, as it were, that that discolors the flesh around us and kills it. And that begins surfacing in all our relationships, but that's not where we start. We start on the inside. And so when Jesus came to this earth, what we find time and time and time again is that something surfaces on the outside and Jesus takes it to the inside. Let me just give you, they won't be on the screen, just listen. You probably are familiar with some of these passages. Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Can you imagine? Parents die. Oldest brother gets the inheritance, doesn't give the younger brother his portion. Just going on in life like that. It's a problem, right? I'm always as a parent befuddled when the kids come to me and trying to figure out who's right and who's wrong. I'm Solomon. I don't like that. Jesus said, be on your guard against all covetousness. He doesn't go to the brother who's probably there. He goes right to this man's heart. To the roots of covetousness you take care of that and you'll hand this problem will handle itself and maybe in your response to your brother 
in an uncovetous way will cause your brother's covetousness to be exposed as well. His theft. Now, Luke 7, when the Pharisee who invited him saw this, this is Simon. He's seeing an unclean woman washing Jesus' feet with her tears, with her hair, very intimate, letting down her hair. He said to himself, that if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering him said, Simon, I have something to say to you. What does he do? He tells him a parable about one who is forgiven much and one who is forgiven little. And whose response to the one that forgave was appropriate. More appropriate. What's he do? He goes into Simon's love. He goes into the inside of Simon. He's sitting across from him with a desk like a surgeon saying, Simon, you have a problem. I want to talk about your insides. Another passage. Behold, Lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus starts, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. You interpreted it right. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Please say the people that I treat rightly. And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers. And he begins to elucidate, to to draw out, to illuminate that this man's heart towards the people he didn't like were not as right as the people he didn't like. He goes to the heart. That's what He does. Just like the surgeon. And just imagine, just imagine that Jesus is looking at all these people and He's bringing to the surface their ugliness knowing that He's going to absorb it. Jesus is looking at every tumor that He Himself will absorb and take. This is our Savior. This is our sacrificial Lamb. This is why He came. To walk the earth, look people in the eye, hear their voices, discuss what's wrong with them on the inside, all while intending to go there Himself. And this is why Jesus is our ticket. Because when we look to have the law internalized in us, we are dead. We have dead flesh inside of us. We cannot perform it. And so that's why the answer is for us ourselves to be internalized in Christ. We can't get the law inside of us on our own. We need to go inside of Jesus. Look at what Paul says in Philippians 3.9. Being found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And it all comes from being found in Him. In Him. Do you know that that is the most common designation of Christians, of believers in the New Testament? It's not Christian. It's in Him. That's the most common way to refer to believers in the New Testament. In Him. Let's say it together. In Him. When we are in Him, our hearts and our flesh are made new. That is the first step and only step from there on out is to recognize that you are in Christ. And as a result of being in Christ, the law is in you. Your heart's made new. 
My favorite preacher, Martin Lloyd-Jones, put it this way. Do not simply look at yourself. Look at yourself in Him. Because that is where you are. That is how God looks at you. God no longer looks at you in Adam. That is the whole point of the Gospel. Look at yourself exclusively and entirely in Christ. Friends, this is the only way you will behave. It's the only way you will ever behave properly when you see that you are not your own, but that you belong to God. That you are not your own, but that you and I are in Christ. When I am in Christ, when I, under, when I see myself as being in Christ, I behave properly. When I see myself apart from Christ, I behave improperly. I've shared with you several times the, one of the most important quotes in my life by A.W. Tozer that the most important thing about a man is what comes into his mind when he thinks about God. It's an incredibly important quote. And I think what I would, I would love to talk to Tozer sometime in heaven and, and, and run this by him and I think he'd wholeheartedly agree is this. When you think about God, which is the most important thing about you, what should you think about God? And I'll tell you. What you should think when you think the most important thought about God is this. What God thinks of you. What God thinks of you in Christ. That's the most important thought you can think about God. What does God think about me in Christ? And Paul tells you in 1 Corinthians 6, You've been washed. You've been clean. You've been sanctified. You've been made holy. You've been regenerated. You're new. So behave as though you're new. Because you are new. This is the love of God in Jesus Christ. And so we get to the final passage of the sermon. So, and I'll add this. Have you come to know and to believe the love that God has for you? Have you come to know and to believe the love that God has for you? Before your feet hit the ground in the morning, is that who you are? Is that how you're going to approach the day? I am loved by God. I am precious in His sight. I do not need praise. I do not need service. I do not need affirmation. I don't need things to go right. I need this. I am loved by God. I am hidden in Christ. When my past sins come to mind, when I'm reminded of that, whether someone brings it up, or I see what my past sins have created in my life, and I'm, and I'm surrounded by the, what my past sins are as I see those sins surface in the people around me or in my circumstances or the job that I now have because I screwed up in that job. Whatever it is. As Satan throws his darts, are you bogged down? Do you turn to elements of this world? Material? Or liquid? Or food? Or entertainment to dismiss the thought? Or are you renewed in the fact that you are hidden in Christ and those things are not held against you anymore? There's no more condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Do you move forward? Are you active? Are you moving with the gifts that God's given you with the confidence that you ought because you are loved by Jesus and newly defined by Him and hidden in Him? That is why Jesus came. To liberate us to fully embody the image of the ten. And the only way that's possible is in Christ. To be hidden in Christ. You are holy, invincible, confident, emboldened to do 
that which is right according to his command. So recognize your identity. And if you don't have the right identity, if your identity is still your own, turn right now to Jesus Christ and lose your identity in Him and you'll find your true identity. Amen? Last musicians to come.